So good afternoon, everybody. My name is Louise Kingham and I am board member and ambassador for Powerful Women. And in my day job, I'm chief executive of the Energy Institute. And we're here in our Energy and Conversation series and we are going to be talking this afternoon to Sinead Lynch, who is chair of Shell in the UK. Sinead, hello, how are you? Hello, Louise. I'm very well, thank you. Good to see you. Yeah, lovely to see you too. We're getting to do a lot of this these days, aren't we? Aren't we just though? Yeah, it's become our, definitely we've got a lot better at it with the time, which is good. Yeah, we've had quite a lot of practice in the last few months, it's true. <laughs> it's mad. I, I've never looked at myself on a screen so much as I have over the last four months. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I know what you mean. Yeah. Uh, so tell me, tell me a bit about your, um, your career journey and your story for people that don't, don't know you. Yeah, okay, happy to do so. So um, I guess I, I came into the energy industry. Um, I joined the old British Gas in 1993 as a, um, a processing geophysicist, actually. So I came in on the really technical end of, of geophysics. Um, did that for about a decade, maybe a bit less. Um, and then just suddenly decided, having never been interested in business, never done a single business course in my life, that I really fancied moving into the commercial side of the business. Um, which took a little bit of time, um, what with me having not much in the way of formal qualifications or capabilities. So I moved from being a geophysicist to being an economist for a couple of years in the upstream business, and then from economics into commercial management, and then into asset management, um, with a, a few stints in between in, in areas like um, investment appraisal to improve my financial knowledge, um, and then was our asset general manager running our business in Thailand, uh, BG, still with BG, so it started with them and, and was still there sort of 23 years later, um, running our, our business in Thailand uh, when um, we had a new CEO called Helga Lund who came in and decided he wanted to radically change the, uh, the executive committee. So we went from sort of an all male um, executive committee to, to five nationalities, 30% female. Um, and so a huge amount of change. Um, uh, and he offered me the role of um, EVP of safety and sustainability on the BG executive committee, uh, which I thought long and hard about. Things how I'd had loads of different um, elements to my career, but none of them were in safety or sustainability. So it was a bit of a move. Um, and then um, so took that role on and six weeks later, Shell, the BG board announced that they were uh, they were they were recommending to shareholders to accept an offer for BG group um, from Shell. So so then my role kind of changed radically to yes, OK, your EVP safety and sustainability, but you're also sort of EVP for integration. You're, you're leading the integration planning between on the BG side between BG and Shell. Did that for 10 months um, with uh, my Shell counterpart, Hybrid Bugabeno, who's now Shell's EC director for downstream. Um, and then once and then once the deal closed and BG was owned, Shell worked integrating the company um, with Hybrid. I worked for him for about seven months, six months, um, and then got offered my current role um, by uh, Shell CEO Ben Van Burden. So I uh, took on the role of UK country chair, which um, again, a really different role to anything I had I had done before. Wow, so I mean, that's a heck of a journey. And, and, and so what's different about the role that you have today? Well, well, I mean, I guess the chairman role is, is by its very nature, quite a, a different role to the roles I was used to, which were more either in the functional leadership positions or in business leadership, you know, running running a business, running a p and um, yeah. so, so it is far more of, a, of an integrator and, I guess, coordinator role. You know, we have a lot of different businesses in, in the UK and, and functions. Some of them are UK businesses. Some of them are global businesses based here. Um, so so uh, the only place that everything comes together at the country level is through the country chair's office. So, so there's just there's a lot of different elements to the role. Um, certainly um, senior stakeholder engagement. Um, I am effectively the senior representative of Shell in the UK. Um, there's a responsibility for our, our reputation in the UK. Um, all the cross-cutting country activities. So how we support our people communication, our social investment strategy, they, they all sit under my, I guess, uh, my general remit. And, um, and I'm also responsible for our UK energy transition strategy. So it's just the depth and I guess breadth of the role is, um, is really the coolest part, I guess. It just, yeah. I like to integrate, I like to join dots um, and I like people. And I spend yeah. a lot of my time with really interesting people from all, all backgrounds and all elements of society. And you know, that, that's quite a privilege. 
So it's a huge amount of collaboration, isn't it, I guess, that is, is really fundamental to making that all work. But yeah, it, it is because you don't, you know, I don't have line accountability. And so, so there's, it's a sort of, there's guidance and support and integrating and coordinating and influencing. Uh, so yeah, very, very different role and a very different set of skill sets actually to uh, the, the roles I had before. So big, steep learning curve. And, and so after all of that journey uh, and trying to sleep and, and have a life in between times, uh, you then walk into a pandemic like we all did a few months ago uh, and have to lead through that, which um, mm. I, I, I guess, like for all of us, has obviously been a challenge. But, but how have you found it? How have you how have you approached leading through this situation that we've had for the last few months? Oh, well, you know, I, I think similar to your own experience, Louise, it, it has been a pretty intense time. Um, you know, it, it, there's been this sort of tsunami of, of challenges and, and, and uncertainties to, to navigate. Um, but, but there's something about leading through through times like this, that they, they bring this sort of very strong kind of clarity of purpose. You know, you what you're there to do, where you can make a difference. And, and I get a lot of, I guess, energy and, and focus um, fr from that. So you've got all the normal elements of, of leading. Yeah, but but obviously massive focus on, on supporting and, and keeping people, your staff, but also your contractors, your customers safe and, and keeping your business moving. Uh, you know, and in our case, it was a business that had to keep moving, um, as you'll know very well, it's continued yeah. to energy. Um, but we're also going through a, a really difficult time um, when you look at the, the complete collapse in demand for our products. And so the, the, the collapse in pricing and, and in margins. And so there's also this sort of cash preservation element that you've got to be thinking through as well. And so I guess, you know, that the first month particularly was this sort of treadmill of, of decision making. And, and it's crisis mode, right? So everything has to be yeah. done quickly. And, and it's about thinking and working differently to, to manage those compressed time frames and, and, and the uncertainty. And, and you know what it's like, you want to get it right always, um, and you know you won't. And, and so there's that need to ask a lot of questions and really listen hard and, and make decisions swiftly based on the priorities you've set and then be really humble and course correct if and when if you do get it wrong. You get it wrong, yeah. So, so it's 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 been quite it's been quite full on, but it's also in, in many ways been quite rewarding because you know the, the UK community, all everybody just came together and it felt like a community. You know, this sort of collective response from teams yes. and line managers and leaders, and it felt like everybody really cared for each other, um, and, yeah. and that, that actually made quite a difference. You know, you don't always feel that day to day in in a, in a corporate environment the way you might do in in different environments. But but it, it really did feel like um like a community response and a community effort. So, yeah, real coming together, isn't it? And it, and now that we look at each other in bedrooms or living rooms or corners of stairwells or wherever it is that people have got their backdrop from, uh, you you get to see the sort of the more human side of people and, and even meet pets and children and family members and goodness knows what, don't you? So you do. It has that has been a. I think that's been quite an upside actually of this entire experience because if you like people and people are a big part of why you do what you do and certainly for me that is and I know that's important to you it's it's given this experience has given that a completely different flavor and I do hope it, when things change inevitably they will I kind of hope we'll keep some of that because it's introduced a real sort of human side to um, the sort of the world the corporate world in which we all live in and and I think made it better. I, I completely and utterly agree. I, I, I mean, to a, set, to a certain extent, when you're, um, you know, working with people every day in the office environment, you, you get to know some of them quite well. Um, but there is a whole other dimension when you are looking into their home uh, on a call. And, and I think it's even more so with external contacts who, you know, you normally see in very formalized business environments or the like and meetings and roundtables. And all of a sudden somebody's perched on a bed. Having a pretty serious conversation about about you know policy or green economy and and it, it does it, I think we've all got to know each other differently yeah. and and therefore um there's more of a humanity to the to the engagements and to the relationships and I'm with you I, I would like I would like much of that to stay yeah absolutely and of course Shell is also in transformation on the path to net zero so not only did you have all of this to deal with but you've got dramatic change happening inside the organisation anyway. 
Yeah, yeah, that was a really interesting one. I, I um, you know, because we've been doing lots of work on what it would take to be a net zero energy and net zero emissions energy company. And, and you do have that thought, well, is this the time to, to launch that sort of ambition, you know, in the midst of this global pandemic? But, but the reality is, as well as managing all the really sort of like tomorrow, short term, today, tomorrow, short term stuff, and indeed the medium term business plans and, you know, what we do with projects, there's this sort of, you have to, you have to look to the future. You know, you can't take your eye off the future, you lose it. And, and I think it's our, you know, it's very hard to call the future right now. This is, um, you know, crisis of uncertainty, Ben Van Burden calls it, and I think that's spot on. But, but I think that the, the, it would seem to me, and, and I think very much to, to us that, that a lot of those trends that existed anyway, whether it's digitization or decarbonization and energy transition, or gosh, you know, how we chop, that they've all been accelerated. And, and, and so um, it, it seems therefore that it was a good time to put out that sort of ambition to be a net zero emissions energy company and, and to use this disruption and dislocation in the whole energy system. And it's been pretty phenomenal. Um, it sort of springboards and, and accelerate the journey we were on anyway to, to move to, um, you know, to transform the company over over the decades ahead. So that's exciting. Um, but but there's an awful lot to do. So it's daunting, too. Um, and, and, and you can't take your eye off the here and now either. So, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so, so the change, you know, people talk about moving to this new normal. Um, but, but I think change is the new normal. And, and actually, we're just going to have to get used to to disruption and and paces of change that that are unusual for our industry because as you know we're quite a stable industry we tend to and some of that will stay i mean infrastructure takes time to transition but i think with the customer attitudes and behaviors and needs they will start to shift faster and that's a yeah. good thing i think overall. Yeah. i i agree and i think when you when you look at the sort of the ipsos mori polls about how society feels about climate change yeah. And you see the ESG movement just keeps keeps coming with more and more and more expectation. And um, that all feels different to post 2008 and the last sort of crisis, the corporately that we, we had economically, because those things have remained constant. And so none of that's gone away. So so it would be to me, it would seem like a real loss of opportunity to go backwards and decelerate on transformation programmes. And, and energy transition programs as opposed to use it as an opportunity like you say to almost go faster and do more uh, and, and i think that's right and I, I think because this has been a unlike the latin obviously there was a systemic element to the financial crisis but this 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 has been such a systemic this this location on every single dimension of our lives and that's a little bit what climate change is going to bring to us and so i i, yeah. I, I, I and i also think there's something here around you know um been quite involved in some of these green dis discovery, green recovery um, discussions with with government and, and with broader sort of thought leaders and and um, institutions and the like. And 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 there is a bit of a perfect coming together, isn't there, of of what we need to do for net zero and what we need to do to recover the economy and create jobs and bring in investment and what we need to do to have a more equal society and and the whole levelling up agenda. So it just seems like, gosh, if ever there was a sweet spot to, yeah. to put your foot on the accelerator, this is it. And, yeah. and, and I think if we lose the momentum now and we don't use this springboard for change, you kind of think, gosh, what's it going to take? It feels like then we have to wait until climate change gets to a point where we're all, where, you know, we're as much about adaption as we are about, um, um, you know, minimizing it, if you like. Uh, so yeah. so I'm, I'm, I'm determined to stay very positive and optimistic about what we can achieve through this. Um, and, and, um, and I think and you definitely see governments here, but also all around the world, you know, Germany, the EU really stepping into this space now, right? I mean, that feels yeah, it, it does. And like when you and I did that Just Transition Commission uh, uh, event, you know, that, that it, it sort of landed with me a bit then about how this was all coming together and was a real opportunity. And, and, and really I'd been invited to that event particularly to talk about the challenges for the oil and gas industry. And yeah. so actually, no, flip it, flip it, because it's opportunity um, and there's space for everybody. And there's there's a really important role for different parts of the energy system to to engage and connect with customers, with stakeholders in order to to make more progress. And I, it sort of changed the sentiment of the, the conversation. So I think they started in one place and, and fortunately, I think, ended up in another. Yeah, uh, which is I think is a positive thing. It's a positive thing. 
I think it's hugely positive. And I think the way the oil and gas industry has responded also through this, you know, it wasn't just gel with our ambition during this time. We came out as, a, as an upstream sector in the UK with the emission reduction targets and pretty yeah. challenging ones, right? And so yeah. again, the sector's now stepping out, not just in, in defense of oil and gas, but in, in, in making the case for the role oil and gas and the sector can play in the transition journey to net zero. And that feels different to a few years ago. Yeah, I think, yeah, I, really I think that's right. Yeah, yeah, and I agree. And and there's about there's about bringing all skill sets and capabilities together because the challenge is so great, right? So it, we don't have to be competing with each other in that sense because there's space for everybody and and people bring different things to this, which are valuable, given the scale of the challenge and the pace at which we need to go. Yeah, and I think that's where maybe net zero, legislating for net zero has changed things. I heard somebody say the other day, it's 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 meant we can't hide in the 20% anymore. You know, when we had a weight percent reduction, there was this kind of like, well, we don't have to move to fasting on our heat, or maybe it's maybe it's something else. Was well, you've got no, that's gone now. And so you need everything and everybody's got to decarbonize. And and yes, some of it will be harder than others and will take longer and we'll we'll need some carbon system sequestration in there but but it just it has changed the conversation fundamentally that that legislation um and and you see it in the way sectors are beginning to come together to look for solutions um particularly yeah. the harder to the harder to decarbonize sectors you know like ours like aviation so so again hell of a lot to do but but you kind of feel like we're, we're coalescing in the right groups around the right questions and start yeah. to put our money and our intellectual capital into, okay, well, what do we need to start doing? And you hear that from government, right? It's not just sort of waffly language anymore. It's what are the concrete actions yeah. we, we, we now need to start taking over the next 12 to 24 months. Um, Absolutely. Music to our ears, right? Because that's what yeah, we Yeah, no, no, com completely, completely. And I, and I know that you've always taken a very positive, proactive approach in the policy making environment to be supportive and throw in potential solutions and get people talking and coming together. But it does, uh, you know, and, and obviously you're involved with the hydrogen uh, group now with, with, with Quasi and the, the other, other fours that you are involved in. So you must have seen quite a shift in the conversation and the appetite to, to get this done now. Yeah, you, you do. You feel almost uh, I, I, so I co-chair the Hydrogen Advisory Council with with, um, with, with the Energy Minister Kwasi Kwarteng and we had the first inaugural meeting last week and, and the impatience and the energy in the room um, was just tangible and, and you know, really great. And, and there were some really good questions put to the group, you know, really challenging questions that made people think. And um, so, I, you know, I, I there's again first meeting long way to go but but the focus is very much on 2020s what can we do to deploy what do we can do in the next 12 to 24 months and that's exactly um, what we need to be talking about because we don't know exactly what what is you know there's a lot of theories you know, there's a lot of models out there on on 2040 and 2050 and they're all very important and they they they, they help our thinking but but most of them require the same basket of technologies right and so and so most of them require us to do a whole lot of fairly low regret things in the 2020s to build a foundation and then certain technologies will will leapfrog and win and others won't do what we think they're going to do and that that will work its way through but there's just so much we can get after now to position yeah. ourselves for that scale in the 30s and, um, and you see you see more of that sort of integrated systems thinking in conjunction with sort of short term action focus now compared to a few a year ago even so we'll see of course, we need you, to keep putting yeah it we do we do and of course um you and i will both know as part of uh, powerful women's energy leaders coalition that we need all of the talent uh, that we can possibly mm -hmm. reach out to to do all of these things and you know whilst we've made some progress we're not quite there uh, and we've got so like you saying you know beginning of all sorts of journeys but some way to go so I wondered if we could just move on to talk a little bit about that now and, and reflect I guess in the first instance obviously we had some good news this year when the powerful women uh, board stats were done for the UK and we saw that we went from up from sort of 16 percent to 21 percent of board seats being occupied by women and we saw growth from 6% to 13% of those seats being held as as, non, as executive roles, uh, as opposed to non-executive roles. So a good step forward, but still a long way to go. So, and of course, we've still got, was it something like 38% of the top 80 companies that are listed or headquartered here have got no women on their boards whatsoever. So there's, there's clearly quite a lot to be done. What, 
what's your take on where we're at and where we've got to, where we need to go? Yeah, I think I, I, I land very close to where you are, which is, you know, if I was a report card, we're, we're definitely showing signs of improvement, but we could do better. You know, I, I, I think the Power for Women stats are pretty thought provoking and, and, and they, they do, to an extent, reflect an industry which in certain parts, particularly in the oil and gas side of things, you know, has been pretty male dominated for a really long time. Yeah. And, and actually, what's interesting to me is we see some similar challenges coming through in some of the newer industries like offshore wind. Um, but what's good there is that you know, they're coming up with sector deals that are putting diversity targets you know, at the core of what they're committing to do. Um, and, and so I think you know, that sort of recognition that we, you know, we cannot, we cannot lo learn, lose the lessons of the past, we need to learn them, um, hugely, hugely important. And, you know, I, and I'm also quite mindful, Louise, that you know, we can't just have focus just at the top of the house. Mm -hmm. you know, we've really got to focus on, and we talked about this quite a bit at the Energy Leaders um, uh, coalition uh, board meetings. You know, we've got to focus on 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 making sure the pipeline is full. That that the best talent in all its forms is is doing the right subjects and the right degrees, and then wanting to join our industry because you know we're competing for talent now, right? With yeah. Some other industries, some of whom you know today um, seem more attractive. I I I think to 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 some to some of the the, the young people out there, and so we've got a bit of a job to do there. To, to, to attract them in and then and then to retain that talent and and and, and there's a part of me that feels you know we've done oh, a lot of it's very different to when I started in the industry in 1993 yeah and I think that it does feel like a number of the what I would call organizational barriers that were in play are beginning to crumble in some areas get a bit dented in others but you know we're def I definitely see progress there and so there were very few female role models when, when I joined and I, and I used to look up and think there's just nobody up there that I, I want to be or I want the life, the, the life that they have. And so you say, well, that's positive. We've got more role models now. Um, I mean, in Shell in the UK, 30 percent of our senior roles are female. So, so that's a really positive thing. And, and I think we're getting a bit better at realizing careers are not just linear in that classic, very male dominated way. I think we're seeing that careers can ebb and flow and people can plateau for a while and but you need to remember their talent and pick them up afterwards and get them back on if they're interested on that progression ladder. So there's sort of stuff that feels like it's it's going well. And then there's other and there, it's partially organizational, but it's also partially societal barriers where I think we've still got quite a bit to do. You know, dual careers are difficult. It can be people make decisions on, on whose career goes first. Senior jobs often require long hours, lots of travel. That's often a choice that actually talent, both male and female, don't want to make. Mm. So, so we've got sort of still, I think, more to do in, in how we think about roles like this and how they're done. And maybe COVID help us, helps us with that, right? Because, you know, people who were never off a plane haven't been on a plane for four months. And actually, things have worked pretty well.